Welcome everyone in this webinar today on value-based healthcare and patient safety. My name is Khalid Charahili, Director of Transformation at Value in Health, and your moderator for today's session, inshallah. Today we are hosting, we are hosted by Saudi Patient Safety Center, and I would like to thank them for this invitation and providing the opportunity to speak about a relevant topic on value and health and patient safety. I'm pleased to introduce my friend, Dr. John McGee. He's the Director of Policy and Knowledge at the Center for Value and Health. John, in this role, he is working in development of policy and research program on the Center for the last three years in Saudi Arabia, but drowning on learning of the best practice. So John uh, is working in Saudi Arabia for the last three years, and he is bringing the best practice from all around the world. And before joining the center, John worked as healthcare strategy cons consultant at AT Carney, a global management consultancy firm. John graduated from University of Oxford with Master of politics and philosophy and economics. And he holds an MPA certificate from Granfield School of Management and a PhD from University of Birmingham. Welcome on board, John, and please go ahead. Hi, Khalid. Hello, everybody on the call. Really pleased to be here. Yes, welcome, John. I'm going to uh, present for about 30 minutes on value-based healthcare and patient safety. And then I think we're gonna take some questions from the audience for the remainder of the time today. Um, the questions we taken at the end of the session, so you, you're really very much encouraged to post them as we go uh, in the chat. Um, I, I'd also like to share my thanks to the Saudi Patient Safety Center for the invitation to provide and share some thoughts on value-based healthcare and patient safety. And uh, thanks everybody for giving up an hour of your afternoon, or if you're in Riyadh like me, your early evening, uh, to think with me um, about these concepts. I have a few slides, hopefully not too many, and um, I'll kick straight into them. Just to set your expectations about what I'm planning to cover in the presentation today, I will first uh, intend to talk about how globally health system policymakers are increasingly turning to value based healthcare as a set of goals, methods, and tools to address the accelerating challenges of healthcare reform. I'll then uh, provide some links, as promised, between the concepts and practices of patient safety and consider how these relate to the delivery of better value. And then I'll finish with a short case study. Uh, mainly to illustrate the sort of practical realities of bringing together safety and value within organizations, and then we'll have plenty of time for your questions. I hope that's OK for everybody. Um, before we get to the main points I plan to cover, I just wanted to, to um, give you a few words about where I'm personally I'm coming from uh, on these topics in the context of my current role uh, and organization. Um, as Khaled mentioned, I, I lead the policy work of value and health which is a national knowledge center and think tank on value-based healthcare. We work as a catalyst to accelerate the delivery of, of a high value health system in Saudi Arabia. And we do this by collating, curating and communicating knowledge and best practices, developing data and insight to inform policy making and building understanding, alignment and capability among those leading and delivering care. What that means in plain English is we think a lot about value-based healthcare. We talk to people a lot, we write a lot, we share a lot, we research. We're really interested in value-based healthcare. Uh, value and health is led, as I'm sure many of you know, by Dr. Reem Benyan, who is a consultant neurologist and a global thought leader on value-based healthcare. Dr. Reem is also the executive director of the G20 Global Innovation Hub for Improving Value and Health. Um, one of the functions of uh, Value and Health is to host and provide the secretariat for uh, this 
G20 um, organization. The, the hub, which was established as part of Saudi Arabia's presidency of the G20 in 2020, is an organization of constituent countries, and its primary mission is to accelerate the global transformation towards value-based healthcare through collaboration and knowledge sharing. I mentioned the hub because many, if not all, maybe most of the examples and points of evidence that I'll be sharing during this presentation draw on global comparator work commissioned by the hub. I'm planning to, I'll aim to take a more of an international rather than a Saudi specific perspective today, maybe a region specific perspective. But of course, if there are questions about value based healthcare and patient safety in the Saudi context, I would be more than happy to talk about these during the Q&A. So the turn to value in health system policy. In the history of health policy, value based healthcare is a relatively new concept, but it is one that many countries have rapidly incorporated in their approaches to health system transformation. Value based healthcare can be thought of as both a goal and a method. It focuses on the achievement of better outcomes that matter to patients while efficiency, efficiently managing the resources used to generate those outcomes. The goal is to bring about a health system that consistently and resiliently delivers high value. The methods most commonly mentioned to facilitate this goal include on the left hand side of the slide here, uh, establishment of data, digital data systems, planning and delivering services for defined population segments, integrating services across geographies, providers and pathways, and incentivizing end-to-end -end care by paying for value rather than for volume. The right-hand side of the slide shows what features a high-value health system might be expected to have. As a person-centric approach, we would expect to find holistic care addressing mental and physical health needs equally, Strong, uh, strong focus on prevention and primary care services that are easier for patients to navigate, for instance. We would also, as it's typically con uh, conceived of, expect to find much greater visibility of input, output, process, outcome and cost measurement, high technological enablement, and we'd expect to see the new payment mechanisms to incentivize value. I won't rehearse all of the challenges that health systems face that uh, lead to taking a more value based uh, approach. Hardly bears repeating that health systems are under intense pressure from changing demographics, epidemiology, uh, greater citizen expectation and the increasing intensity of clinical practice. But what's also true is that health systems globally are facing increasing scrutiny on both costs and outcomes as governments facing greater fiscal pressure begin to ask more stretching questions about whether their health systems are truly delivering on the outcomes that they feel they're paying for. We have seen unprecedented massive investments in health systems during COVID, but also in many health systems before the pandemic. Some health systems are, quite reasonably, asking where precisely are the improvements in the nation's health that I've paid for? Uh, one other quick point just before we go further. So uh, value and health, as an independent think tank is led by the evidence and aims to take an objective and critical perspective on all the models and evidence that we encounter. We emphasize the need for all health systems to deliver better value and acknowledge that many health systems are, you know, making a real um, effort in heading to heading in that direction. The evidence on the effectiveness of the elements of the value based approach such as incentivizing provider performance on the basis of cost and outcome benchmarks is partial, is contested and highly skewed towards examples from the US and high income countries. For all countries, maybe value based healthcare can uh, be seen best as a solid hypothesis that will require more wide scale implementation and rigorous evaluation. And me and my role, and I see the value of, uh, in value in health's role as finding, raising, and addressing these sort of critical and underlying policy questions that remain unresolved about high value health systems. Many countries have taken the view that more of the same is not enough 
So let's briefly look at some specific examples. Uh, this slide visualizes insights from a recent report from the G20 Global Innovation Hub called Drivers and Barriers to Value-Based Care in the Middle East. This report explored to what extent different MENA and North African countries were referencing value as a goal and as a method in their health reforms. For this report, we drew on desk research and stakeholder interviews, talking with policymakers, providers, practitioners and academics from each country. We found many countries were targeting value as a goal using slightly different language in each, and most were developing or in the process of delivering long term plans to deliver on this goal. Interestingly, uh, value based healthcare in these countries uh, was often explicitly linked to universal health coverage. Several countries saw improvements in outcomes and costs as being critical to relieving current and future pressures to enable expansion of access and coverage and achieve, achieve um, universal health coverage. So what's interesting here is um, value based healthcare is is happening. Um, certainly there are no future facts and um, we wouldn't uh, deterministically say that value value based healthcare is an inevitability. But what's clear is many countries are driving towards value and value based healthcare as a destination using the tools of VBHC to to enable that. So it's clear to see that the policymakers really have picked up on the idea of value based healthcare. But what exactly is it we're talking about when we're talking about value based healthcare? Value is certainly a composite concept. In its simplest form, it can be think, thought of as a, a relationship between outcomes and costs or a ratio of outcomes achieved to costs incurred. It's more useful, we think, to consider the multifactorial nature of value and look to identify, measure, respond to its critical sub elements. As listed on this slide, these will be familiar to most people on today's call and certainly to anyone with an interest in health system performance assessment. So we have uh, effectiveness uh, being about delivering the right care, efficiency about delivering it in the right way, making best use of scarce resources. Equity is important, increasingly important in ensuring, ensuring um, fair access to health opportunities for all. And responsiveness talks to the need to ensure that what we do in health policy and practice genuinely reflects the aspirations and needs of people. In looking at how proposed policy and practice changes might impact on value, each element will need to be considered. Bringing these together suggests a couple of ideas. What one of value for money in terms of uh, providing the best service for the resources used and value for many, ensuring everyone can get equivalent access and use out of the services provided. I'll take a pause here because I know today's audience is an informed one. And so I'll raise the question that will no doubt be in everybody's minds off the back of this slide. So if this is a conception of value, how do we trade off the different elements of value where these might conflict? So what if we have a health policy measure that's effective, efficient, responsive, but overall reduces equity or an improvement in equity at the expense of efficiency? One simple, maybe simplistic too simplistic answer um, to that uh, there's two elements too. Firstly, we certainly shouldn't expect every country to trade off these elements in exactly the same way. The, the trade off should reflect the specific demand preferences and supply constraints. So you know, what uh, patients and citizens are asking for and how the uh, how providers uh, deliver care. Um, consider those to clarify these trade offs. But secondly, and more critically, it, the most important factor is to have a defined way to resolve these trade offs when they come up that's transparent and open to scrutiny. The specific trade offs and how these are resolved are maybe less important than a commitment to openness about how these contradictions are resolved when they inevitably occur. So we said what value based healthcare is and that many countries are pursuing it for a range of very good reasons. Now we ask if value based healthcare is such a great idea, why don't we already have high value health systems? And uh, in this uh, section, I'll also uh, again refer to the hub report drivers and barriers to value based care in the Middle East. As I comment on the main enablers 
the report identified to, to value based care. I'd like those of you on the call to think about maybe two things. So one, to what extent do you recognize these enablers as either being in place or being lacking in your own health system? Are these universal requirements or are some enablers really more important in certain health systems than others? And two, uh, as ever, uh, I would encourage critical thinking. So in your experience, are these truly prerequisites and what and how much can be done in their absence? Certainly in my experience, I'm always wary of lists of enablers as a kind of a, a readiness assessment as the conclusion it always ends up being the same. We're not ready. How good is good enough for each enabler is a key consideration and it may differ from health system to health system. So bear with me while I quickly go through the enablers clockwise from um, 12 o'clock. Uh, in, in regulation, what's often mentioned uh, when you talk about value is regulation of cost and outcome measurements, uh, professional regulation is really important, and quality and safety regulation. But I would also really emphasize competition and economic regulation as being at least as critical for a high value health system. How we choose to structure the market for public and private providers and how we um, yeah, allocate our capacity and uh, manage competition in that uh, market is really going to have an impact on value. So um, and it's sometimes missed in the conversation. Data and IT infrastructure is definitely an area where much value can be created, but it's also an area where value can really fail to be created. I would advise there being as much emphasis on avoiding poor infrastructure decisions as on making good choices here. These are sometimes the longer term decisions that uh, you can get mired in if you change your mind later. Uh, workforce I would really like to highlight as a, a critical enabler. So often um, the elements of workforce we choose to discuss when thinking about value based health care, we may be overemphasized capacity, training, uh, deployment as levers to better value. And we don't say enough about the need to protect, protect the lived experience of our health workers. I like to think of healthcare as a really ultimately a simple industry of people and buildings, machines and drugs, but our health workers would never be considered as just another type of resource to be deployed or redeployed as needed, skilled up, uh, moved around. They're people um, and, and you know, the um, stress and burnout and the effects of COVID on our uh, workforce force before you even get into conversations around their concepts like joy at work. Um, we really need to make sure that we we take consideration of the exceptional nature of the workforce as a resource in our health system. Um, those who keep up with current health policy and government health policies will know integration across providers and geographies is a clear um, current theme. Again, I'd invite you to consider an integration maybe as a good hypothesis rather than a fully evidenced lever for improving value. With good evaluation, we'll find out. Many health systems are trying integration as a lever at the moment. I think cost and outcome measurement perhaps is self evident How do you know if you're delivering better value if you don't measure it? And finally, the financial levers of value based procurement, pricing and reimbursement also require consideration. Um, in terms of where people who are thinking about value based healthcare are uh, looking at the moment, I point uh, uh, everyone on the call towards a recent global evidence review, which indicated that the, the large majority, vast majority of the value based healthcare academic research at the moment is being done on those last two enablers around measurements and financial incentives. This is helpful directionally for value and health. Uh, as it um, points to potentially a gap and an opportunity to um, to bring some some new insight, but uh, clearly we need to know more about all of these different uh, enablers as we seek to implement value based healthcare. Let's take a quick look at the barriers that need to be addressed at the structural and frontline levels to enable. Um, uh, to need to be resolved to, to enable value-based healthcare. 
again, I'll, I'll make the similar point that the requirement is not to to overcome all of these barriers, but to make whatever positive changes we can to drive improved value despite of these barriers. Um, our change initiatives will absolutely be paralyzed if we feel we have to wait to resolve all of these challenges before we move forward. A few points to highlight just on this slide. Uh, in terms of the barriers, I, I would direct you towards the, the one around um, out-of-pocket expenditure as maybe something that's uh, worthy of discussion in that uh, we, we really mustn't um, implement policy that establishes a health system that's really highly efficient and responsive for the services it provides, but where most people have to pay to go outside of that system in order to access care. Uh, sometimes that, that point gets lost in, the, in the thinking around value-based healthcare. Second point relates to the collection of patient data, uh, the top right there. Uh, we, we should have an understanding and be sympathetic to, to the fact that there are, diff there are different views on the trade-off between maybe the speculative benefits of an accumulation of big data in terms of fine-tuning population health management and delivering at some point in the future uh, precision medicine versus individuals' preferences about data privacy and the practical limits to cybersecurity. I would once again argue it's for individual health systems to define that trade-off with the only universal requirement being that uh, there is transparency in that trade-off when it's made. So how does the turn to value in health system policy relate to patient safety? So uh, clearly and definitionally, a high value health system can never be an unsafe health system. Avoiding errors in care and harm leads to uh, better quality, which leads to improved outcomes and value. It's really a straight line. So while safety is absolutely foundational, a safe health system is not always necessarily a high value health system. Uh, it goes one way, but potentially not the other. I, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to encourage a stronger understanding and to explore whether the methods we're using to keep patients safe are best value. Uh, we should, all, uh, given that though, we should also view improving patient safety as being a powerful lever, one of the most powerful levers maybe, for improving health system value. I'll be bold enough uh, here to suggest I'm about to say something that really everyone on this call will know. Um, the point is always worth making. It, I mean, it's really a truism in health system policy that we commit material and avoidable resources to fixing the impacts of poor patient safety that would be much better spent on reducing the likelihood of error and harm by orders of magnitude, of course. Uh, this data from OECD reflects typical ranges of estimated costs of error, harm and wasteful practice in similar global studies. So, I mean, looking at these studies, one would expect somewhere between maybe 10 and 40 percent at the higher end of resource use in health systems to be addressable through value improvement initiatives, including uh, patient safety uh, improvements. I'll start to draw things together by looking at an illustrative example from the literature on um, that indicates some of the practical issues that arise when value and patient safety are considered in specific clinical transformation programs. So this is a value improvement project conducted for a surgical service in a hospital setting in Catalonia, which is a district of Spain. I'm sure you'll all be familiar with similar examples here. The, the problems to be addressed are you know, really very typical. So uh, going left to right here, one to four. So the day to day management of unforeseen operational priorities, um, improving productivity and utilization to reduce waiting times, ensuring effective inventory management and improving the engagement communication with patients um, through the, the pathway. Um, I, I look back a decade ago when I was working uh, with mainly teaching hospitals, actually, but working on hospital improvement strategies. 
I would see most, if not all, of these issues as driving um, investment cases and uh, cases for for change, uh, business improvements um, across across different uh, uh, providers. I would reflect maybe on this slide that each of these challenges is viewed slightly differently, but maybe complementary through a value lens and a patient safety lens. So without belaboring the point, I'd, I'd say that in value terms, day-to-day -day oper operational complexity is likely to lead to increased cost and may compromise outcomes. So there's an op a value op a value improvement opportunity there, clearly. In patient safety terms, I would say that the same complexity can be expected to increase risk, risk of emission and error, unintended harm. So both, you can look, look at the same um, the same set of challenges through both of those lenses. So we take a quick look at the approach this organization took in this case and what the uh, the results were. So this is, an, this is a really interesting case for, for a few different reasons. Um, one is it's very typical of the kinds of example that are often tagged as being value-based case studies. Um, in this instance, and actually you hear about this quite a lot uh, in terms of value-based healthcare. Each issue is addressed by a digital intervention. And uh, clearly there's a lot of interest around digital artificial intelligence, post-COVID, restart take telemedicine, um, that the conceptual link or conversations that you have when you talk about both digital transformation and value-based healthcare, certainly more, more, more than before. Um, so here, the uh, they deployed automated planning and scheduling and online track and trace of patient stuff and equipment and through those levers the service was able to report improvements in value from the three different perspectives patient clinician and uh, provider i'll maybe offer two formative conclusions from this case or uh, the most maybe just some things to think about so, so one is, and maybe maybe the major point is that uh, better value and better patient safety will often be delivered at the same time. So, by seeking better value, safety will improve, given the inter interrelated nature of the concepts, and um, improvements in safety. One would expect if the business case stacks up to also deliver uh, value, short term or long term. Maybe the se second conclusion is to come back to a theme here is to stress a, a, the need for a critical response and a thoughtful, mindful response to this kind of case study. It, you know, it, it's absolutely OK to ask, well, did this really work? Um, as well as could this work here? Could this work for me? Um, like every case study, um, this one reflects a point in time and when and where you decide to declare Victory is is really important in terms of uh, whether a case study reflects success or, or not. Um, I would say in an abbreviated case study like this one in the times that we have, you'll need to get a little bit on trust that the challenge approach and results played out as I'm describing them uh, here. I, I would though really encourage you to interrogate this case and others you see like it more from the, both the value perspective and the patient safety perspective. I mean, for me, things I, I would love to explore on this case are how these solutions reflected the patient's understanding of the problem and their preferences regarding the solutions. I would love to think in this case, uh, they went to patients and talked about um, what are the, na the nature of the, the impact that um, low utilization and throughput challenges are having on you as a, as a patient and, and involved them in shaping these, uh, e you know, even even IT changes, patients will have useful and, uh, and important input. I'd also be interested, we mentioned integration before, I'd be interested in how the changes would impact elsewhere um, on the uh, in this specific pathway, so upstream and downstream, um, but also across other services within the same facility and maybe maybe other providers um, in the same geography. Um, we need to think um, and, and, and anticipate from a complex systems perspective um, the 
unintended consequences of any change. Um, uh, typically, the best response to likely un unresponded, uh, un un um, unintended changes is to anticipate them to the extent that you can in advance, but really rigorously evaluate so that you can uh, course correct as you go. Um, again, the temptation is for me, for any case like this to challenge, are we focusing on the right problem in the first place? So uh, the quotation I always bear in mind when thinking about improving projects is, there's nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency, something that should not be done at all. I think we're bad at this in healthcare. We're bad at asking the initial question in an improvement project. Should we be doing this at all? I think what we know about low value care and waste, we would really benefit from at least exploring that before we then go on to look to optimize, drive value, improve patient safety in the clinical areas that we choose to work on. I would feel a little remiss to conclude the presentation without at least trying to share some high level insights um, that should be at least reflected on for those planning patient safety programs, developing policy, making practice changes in the context of value based healthcare, try to bring about this greater patient safety. So uh, I would pick out from uh, from this list that um, the the reduction prevention reduction of risk i think value based healthcare really needs to reflect the probabilistic nature of patient safety and risk management so you know even bringing patient safety to the value based healthcare conversation is incredibly important and valuable particularly when we attempt to bridge from measuring and improving value to incentivizing it with financial uh, financial payments. The um, the two concepts of value and patient safety really are joined together. We think there are you know it's one of the reasons why we're so excited to get this uh, invitation to talk today. Um, we really must have the two conversations together. It's essential, it's foundational. Um, as I say, an unsafe health system cannot be a high value health system. Um, and I think I'd, I'd maybe land on this idea that, um, particularly for low, low middle income countries, um, value based healthcare is a key that unlocks the door to universal health coverage. I think it's going to require really careful uh, evaluation and course correction. It's unlikely we're going to be able to take a design and implement um, approach, it's going to have to be a lot more iterative. Than that we will need to course correct but as a um, meaningful and um, you know potentially very effective route to universal health health coverage i think value-based healthcare is certainly worth considering in that way so in closing um just a few thoughts from today's session um you know i i uh, wouldn't position myself as an expert in value-based healthcare and how it relates to uh, patient safety. I'm simply somebody who spends <laughs> 23 hours of my day thinking about it and meeting people and talking about it, writing and uh, pulling together the evidence on it. Um, from that perspective, then, you know, I, I'm particular. The, the piece of this uh, uh, webinar that I'm most interested in is your your feedback and questions, and uh, love to, you know challenge and support and think about the uh, the ideas that have been shared so far. Um, I, I think if you take away a few things from from today, really take away the idea that your health system, it's incredibly likely that uh, you are in a health system where value based healthcare is being actively, maybe aggressively pursued and just on an individual basis, it's really important that you can benefit from understanding and anticipating what that's likely to mean. Um, the second sort of high level takeaway is that patient safety is clearly an important component of value. It's on our list of um, research questions. It's in, in the, the domain that we are uh, interested in exploring in value and health for Saudi Arabia, and I'm sure we will be um, speaking uh, closely working with the uh, the patient safety center going forward to uh, to think more about this as a as a topic uh, and then finally you know, I, 
about this presentation and about other presentations that you will see in the future always encourage critical thinking so um, evidence experience examples from other health systems um, especially I think around value-based healthcare where there are um, stakeholders will talk to you about value-based healthcare from a number of different perspectives not just from a kind of an independent think tank perspective it's really important these examples are crit both critically judged but also localized health system policy is national health system policy it's so context dependent uh, and this applies whether we're trying to improve improve value or patient safety or both thank you and uh, back to you Carla. Hey, thank you, John. I really enjoy listening again and again to you. Uh, very informative. Thank you so much. So I'll start with a few questions I listed. And please, uh, dear audience, share your question in the question and answer uh, uh, page on um, on on uh, on Teams, please. So I'll start with the first question to you, John. Uh, what capability is needed? To, to the front li liner to deliver value-based healthcare, and how can we build this? So thank you, thank you, Khalid, and uh, thank you, whoever asked that question. Um, so there's a there's a couple of things at play here. So one is um, to what extent do you do you think that? Um, value-based healthcare is a structural issue versus it being an individual behavioral issue amongst um, clinic clinicians and patients and the decisions that they that they make i i would argue and and certainly take you know express the hypothesis that both are really really important i think of the um the policy that's required for value-based healthcare to be the rules of the game and the um the, the day-to-day -day decisions made by clinicians and patients jointly are operating according to the rules of that, that 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 game so i think it's really critically important to drive towards a health a high value health system that both policy makers and practitioners have the knowledge understanding alignment and capability to be able to take decisions that um, lead to better value and avoid decisions that um the, the damage value so I think it, it is helpful to talk about what capabilities frontliners need, but I think it's equally important to talk about um, what are the behaviours um, and how do we want policymakers to take decisions in order to um, deliver better value. But you did ask specifically around frontline capabilities, and I would say this is very much a work yeah. in progress in terms, in terms of value-based healthcare, uh, value-based uh, value and health understanding of what's needed and what kind of interventions would drive that. We um, are experimenting this year with a program called uh, Act for Value, um, uh, which is a uh, capability building program at the cluster level in the Ministry of Health, uh, where we're trying to understand um, what kinds of improvement methodologies related specifically to the delivery of um, greater value would be most effective. And um, we have got, you know, tremendously interesting feedback from that that I'm sure at some stage we will then um, we will compile into a report and, and share that more broadly. We also have been experimenting this year with a uh, an online program which uh, potentially some of the people on today's call may have participated in. I know we had a, uh, a small uh, cohort um, well, actually quite an extensive cohort to go through that program where um, we try to share sort of the essentials to understand um, what's going on in value and how as an individual practitioner you might you might respond. So I think certainly more needs to be done and um, we, we're working with a number of different partners to try to move that forward. Great, great. OK, so I, I have a second question for you, John. Is sure. value based healthcare. Uh, sorry, what is the relevant of patient reported outcome measure for patient safety, of course? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm sure you find this as much as I do that there are a number of um, topics or concepts or phrases that, uh, when you begin to get in a conversation around value-based healthcare, you often end up also discussing. And, and patient reported outcome measures or PROMs are uh, are absolutely one of those. In that, um, I think you will find people who will argue that value-based healthcare is PROMs 
that once you've done proms, you know, uh, you've kind of unlocked the whole of value based healthy. I, I, I certainly don't think we would go <laughs> that far. Yeah. And uh, and actually, uh, I think we would go really not not anywhere near that far. And again, I think the idea of patient reported outcomes, although it does have quite a long history, um, yeah. it's still a hypothesis rather than yeah. something that we can really demonstrate that sort of universal patient reported outcomes specific and um, specialty specialty specific uh, sorry generic and, and specialty specific problems yeah. everywhere that that's necessarily a good idea so like uh, you know like, like, like any measure we, we would we would want to want to really understand the the impacts on costs and outcomes um, through trials so proof, proofs of concept and, and we're certainly participating in some of that work in Saudi Arabia right now Great, great. Thank you, John, for clarification. And I have a, the next question is a question that most of the time we have been asked in the center that, OK, is value based healthcare just cost cutting? Yeah, this is I, get, question yeah. I think we need to, to yeah. tell you our audience so, about it more. Yeah. So, so this is the point where I, I declare, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm not a clinician. I'm, uh, you know, my, my, my background is more commercial, um, health economics policy. Um, so I do see this thing, this potentially a little bit more different, diff a little bit differently to um, uh, clinicians, uh, those who those have worked in the front line, not in a bad way, but, but, but maybe in a slightly different perspective in that I, I'll, I'll do classic, I'll agree and disagree. So, so yeah, it is really important. Nothing turns off frontline workers more than positioning and improvement as this this just reduces cost. This is a cost cutting exercise. Um, you know, we are merely doing this so that the uh, you know, we can balance the books so we can return. You know, uh, it's it's I, I don't think I've ever found it possible to drive engagement with frontline cl uh, clinicians on that that basis. It's it's you, you really cannot introduce it in that way. However, um, sometimes it is about cost cutting. And, you know, you, you really have a choice and you can either be upfront about it and say, look, you know, we, we are operating globally, sometimes nationally on the basis of reduced fiscal space. Um, we do have a requirement to balance our books. We do have a requirement to um, to reduce to reduce our costs. Sometimes it is about cost cutting and you have a choice about whether to be upfront about that or to you know, sure. talk around it and say, and say that it's not. However, and this is in my experience, um, you can always reduce costs and at the very least maintain outcomes, if not you know, improve outcomes, because there's, there's yeah. typically so much of an opportunity to eliminate waste. So right. whilst it would be it would be a little easier if clinicians were a little more accepting of the idea that sometimes, yeah, we do work within a, a national economy that has its own goals. And sometimes you do need to give up a little bit of resource in order to, mm -hmm. um, to get what you need. I, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. So mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's important. Again, it's one of the reasons why uh, value, cost and outcome, resource and outcome is such a it's fruitful linked. approach. Yeah, it's so it's yeah. so linked, and um, and you know you sometimes have um, uh, health finance people who don't really understand the outcomes, and you have clinicians who sometimes you know sometimes aren't, aren't fully aligned with the uh, and understand the the finances. That having a bridge between the two and a common yeah. language, a common set of goals, it's exactly. uh, for me it's one of the things that's most most potent, most powerful about uh, a value led approach. Yeah, and you know, back to the slide you you showed, John, that that mm. shows that value for money and value for meaning. This is yes. somehow you know answering like majority of, of of the question is just value is cost cutting. Sometimes mm. it's not cost cutting. Sometimes you spend uh, yeah. you and you invest more on your patients and in, in, in a That's service right. that can you know achieve value more than you know your cost cut. So it's not about cost cutting at all. It is about the concept you implement and your practice. OK, great, yeah. great, John. So uh, I'll move to the next question. 
sure. we have. So uh, the question say, what role should we encourage patient to take? So let's focus on patient because we are in patient safety. Um, open up. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, so um, again, I, I'll um, I'll be greedy here, and I'll perhaps give you two answers. I think there's a narrow, it's a narrow answer, and there's maybe a broader answer, and, and I think both are really, are really important to think about. So, value-based healthcare doesn't work if you do not have um, the right structures in place to engage patients in at least two ways. So firstly, you know, uh, because value-based healthcare is about outcomes that um, outcomes that matter to patients, you have to ask patients what outcomes matter to them. You can't just guess. You can't just pull together sometimes clinicians in a room, sometimes uh, managers in a room, and, and just project from the, the knowledge that you think you have at the moment around what mm -hmm. patients value. So a, as a minimum, you can't really say you're doing value-based healthcare unless you've had that really open conversation with patients about exactly what it is that they do value. Um, the, the second thing, again, it, maybe value-based healthcare could work, but it's extremely difficult to make it work if you do not have um, shared decision-making and co-creation of care between doctors and uh, particularly doctors, uh, but, but all frontline clinicians and their patients. We've seen, you know, the, 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 there are many studies that talk about how if patients are fully informed, fully engaged, uh, fully activated, they tend to um, uh, opt for less intensive treatments. They tend to understand a little better when um, doctors don't send them for unnecessary tests. They become partners, not, not only in their own care, but also partners in the frugal and sensible use of the limited health resources that, that are available. So I, I would say, you know, really narrowly, you need um, both uh, the understanding of patient preferences and also the um, the co-creation of care with, with patients before you can move really terribly far forward with um, with others. I'll, I'll say one more thing, if, if you don't mind. So, so the, the broader view, and um, you know the, the the very very long term view on this is that uh, ultimately we do we do require some form of wholesale reimagining of health systems, how they operate, and how patients interact with with the health system. Um, that you know that may be a little bit less practical, a little bit less tangible. And, uh, probably couldn't go into detail right now in terms of what that reimagining might look like. But um, whatever health systems we end up having 10, 20, 30 years from now, I can certainly take the view that, that we will have stronger, more resilient, better value, more effective health systems if we do that, if we develop those and design those, evolve towards those with, um, with, with patients, at least, in the, um, at least in the passenger seat, if not in the driving seat. Yeah. Thank you, John, because, you know, I second you on, on what patient sh should play and the important role for the patient. And uh, I have seen this uh, in, in many international conferences that mm. they have patient champion who's one of the main panelists who's sitting with the leaders side by side, speaking yeah. about his experience, sharing the risk he faced, sharing the challenges he, he faced in the health system and uh, passing the message of his, his, his people, you know, around him who, with the same group of people who suffer from the same illness or issue, mm -hmm. uh, or medical issue. So this is a great opportunity for patient to play a role. And I think it is the responsibility of our center, patient safety center, and mm -hmm. every healthcare provider in Saudi Arabia to start really finding those voice for patient who can really help and support the health system to grow, to shape, and to have a better, you know, representation of patient voice, where all of us, in the healthcare system, mm -hmm. are working to serve them and to 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 achieve the target of what best care we can provide for them. So thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I I I I agree. Yeah. Okay. So we'll take the last question. 
uh, can value healthcare be implemented in a single facility, John, or should be generalized and should be a national wide concept to be implemented? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I have a very clear view on on this, which is in a single health facility, you can always generate better value. You can always go from the amount of value you're currently producing to um, to more value. You can always address um, the outcomes and costs because there's always waste. Um, there's always innovation. There's, there's always an opportunity to do more with the resources that you have, um, to do more with, with fewer resources, reinvest those resources to do new things. So yeah, I, I I definitely think that you can do you can you can produce better value, and actually, um, for individuals that that's where they can make the, the most change is your pathway and your clinic, and mm -hmm. um, it's it's sometimes easier to have the conversation about about you know what what value are you generating in your role in your pathway in your facility rather than going in on think talking about waste. Because everybody agrees that there's waste. It's just nobody says this is their waste. Yeah. Whereas value, you know, sometimes it's easier to have that conversation about value. Where I would disagree is I would say that, and you sometimes see this, that facilities say we have implemented value-based healthcare. Now, mm -hmm. I just have a problem with that just as a, as a concept in that um, I, I don't believe that there is a, a model that you can say, you know, there's a list of things that you can tick off, list of criteria where you can say, you know, yesterday we, we weren't doing value based healthcare and today we are. I, I don't think it's that kind of, I, you know, I don't I don't challenge that people can have that view. It's just not the view that the view that I would have. Yeah. Um, this is why in the sense that we talk about high value health systems rather than about value based healthcare, because it comes back to what I was saying at the beginning, that value based healthcare is both mm -hmm. a goal and an approach. Mm. So, yeah. you know, uh, can, can you achieve best value? No, there's always there's always more value you can go out. Can you tick off yeah. a list of levers and say that you've used these levers in your facility? Yeah, you can do that. But but ultimately, because so many of those levers are around um, working outside the four walls of the hospital or the primary care center, you need to um, work at probably as a minimum around the, the local pathway of care or system of care before you could move to something where you could say, yeah, we've got a we've got a geographic implementation of, um, of, a, of a high value system. I think you could probably do that. Certainly shouldn't. I certainly wouldn't want to discourage um, individuals to work on their own pathways to deliver better value um, within the sort of structural structural constraints of where the systems actually are, is up to at any one point in time. Yes, thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, uh, very good um, answer, John, for this question. So on this point, John, I think we need to leave it here. And on behalf of Patient Safety Center, we would like to thank you, Dr. John McGee, for the presentation, for the great information you share with us. And as a part of the Patient Saudi Safety Center, the efforts they provide um, on, the, on the health system, and the timely topic selected and a great speaker as you john thank you for speaking on this and we are, we would appreciate if you would like to fill out the evaluation survey provided by the end of the session from value and value um, uh, from patient safety center and thank you for the all audience for joining us and welcoming you for uh, to be back in the future event on value, uh, on value, I'm keep saying value because I'm from value. Sorry, from a patient safety center, and uh, happy to chat anytime. We again, we extend our sincere thank to everyone in patient safety center. Thank you, John. Thank you for people who's uh, working in those webinar, and uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Real pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.